lining up behind them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what they're saying, what they were saying is that let us just agree. Uh, you know, we, we may have a few differences, but can we just come together? We, we're, all, we're all worshiping God. We're all in accordance of one thing. And, folks, if, 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 if you don't see that, uh, 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 as you said, church and state joining hands, uh, uh, him getting the power he needs. They, they had a special on not long ago entitled The Pope. Did anybody see that? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, um, this thing is slowly but surely uh, uh, coming together. Something that I did not know. How many of you have gardens in your, in your, in your yard? Have what? Gardens. I used to. Did you not know that there's a law on the book right now? They're not enforcing it for us growing gardens in our yard. Yeah, no. I know. That. And so all of these little things you that are suddenly coming your in. Your own garden. Uh, 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 when it comes to where, you, where we can't buy or sell, well, if I've got my own big garden and stuff going in my yard, I don't have to buy. But if I can ban that, you know, we're, we're, a lot of things are happening quietly as, 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 as we as we sitting here. All right, let's, let's, let's turn to, to Monday's lesson. I'm sorry. Another comment. Uh, please forgive me, and I don't want to be political, but I cannot be politically correct either. <laughs> but uh, I saw an ad, a political ad, that said that in 9-11, uh, the biggest enemy to democracy was in a cave and today the biggest threat to democracy is sitting in the White House yes, sir. and so in order for Rome's uh, system of government to succeed democracy has to disappear but we're not that far out either the way things are going folk <laughs> I, I just feel so inadequate trying to explain this thing. But I'm, I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to come down here and talk with us this morning. Turn it in your Bibles as we go to Monday's lesson, the United States in prophecy. Someone read that very first paragraph right under that. Anybody? People have asked, and understandably so, how could Rome have the kind of influence today or in the future that is depicted in Revelation 13? Long gone are the days when it, it could, could command armies as it did in times past. The answer is found, too, in Revelation 13. All right. I'm going to get you to read a couple of verses here. In Revelation 13, 11, and 12, we're going to read that, then we're going to discuss it a little bit, try to find out which mark help us understand this power, who this power is. Someone reading Revelation 13, 11, and 12. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. I want you to read that second paragraph at the bottom starting with about this point in history. She's got it right here. About this point in history, near the close of the 42 months, another power appears. It arises this time out of the earth, which is in contrast to many of the previous powers which arose out of water, a symbol of masses of people. The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. I keep reading. For these reasons and others, this power must be the United States of America, which arose in a relatively uninhabited part of the world and didn't need to un overthrow any major empires in order to do so. All right, one more paragraph. Okay. What nation of the New World was in 1798 rising into power? 
giving promise of strength and greatness and attracting the attention of the world. The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation and only one meets the specifications of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. And that comes from the great controversy. You know, you know, we, we had a lot of debate when the when the when the uh, guys were running for president. We had one fellow come out and say, "Have you ever read the Constitution?" Remember that? The Constitution simply says, as it starts to say, "We hold these truths to be what self-evident that all men are created equal, and that they are what." endowed by their creator with certain inalterable rights that among these are what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness. Happiness. Now, unless you've been living on a rock, a lot of that stuff is about to change. And many of that stuff will change, and it's going to change because of a lot of the stuff that's happening right now to give uh, an example as we run over the Tuesday's lesson about the issues of worship. All of these things change when what happened? When 9-11 happened. Where were you when 9-11 happened? I remember it. I was driving my daughter to school over there at Shenandoah. Had to do it every morning, two hours on the road. And I had her in the car for a whole hour each day and, and, and talked to her. But I remember when they said a plane had ran into what? The World Trade Center. Then a few minutes later, what? Another plane had ran into the World Trade Center. Then another plane flew where? Into the Pentagon. You know, America, we were under attack. And I was so shocked when they was talking, when they walked in and they was talking to, it was George W. Bush then called presidents and stuff in here, but folks, we just got to call them. But he was sitting there reading a, 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 a story to the kids. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it didn't seem like he was excited at all. You know? I mean, he, was, he was sitting there, and they, they, they ran in, and he was, he was sitting there reading a, a book to the kids, and, and they, they told him that America was under attack. You know? I don't know, but if, 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 if I'm the president and America's under attack, he went, on reading, <laughs> he went on reading the story like nothing had happened. But things changed. Now, and I don't know whether you've been watching the news. I, I think I watch it too much. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm so glad of Daniel and Revelation. Because when I read that, I know that you know, nobody's going to be taking over the world. There's going to be some terrible things happen because the Bible predicted that. But since 9-11, a lot of these privileges and stuff that we hold so dear uh, uh, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, those things are going to be changed, and they are slowly being taken away. Uh, you know, know, what really baffles me is um, every time we have a school shooting, and uh, when I went to school when I was young, I was skinny and puny, how I ever had in the lunch money. But my biggest fear was some big bully taking my lunch money. You know? And let me tell you, I got a many whippings, but I held on to that lunch money. But my biggest fear was being have my lunch money taken. My biggest fear was not sitting in a classroom and someone come in with a with a gun that they don't need to hunt with and gun down a bunch of kids. My heart breaks every time I see that. But because of all of these devastating things that keeps happening, uh, it seems like some deranged person, some person with a mentally ill, some person managed to get, get a hold to a gun. And I'm going to tell you, I don't care how, how you try, you're never going to stop folk from getting guns. Uh, the folk who, who are not going to be able to get a gun, uh, many, many folk who are law-abiding citizens are one's not going to be able to buy a gun. The criminals can buy a gun anytime they want it. I can, walk out, I can walk out of here right now with a few dollars and I can get a gun. So all of this gun law, I'm, I feel sorry to say it, but I believe in God. That, that's who my trust is in. 
and, 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 and every time I read, What's happening with all of these disasters is they're going to take away our rights slowly. Now, here's what gets me. Every time one of these shootings happen, what happened? We have a prayer vigil. Everybody lights candles, and we stand outside, and we pray, and we cry, and, and, and I cry because it hurts me. But we get right back up, and we don't allow praying in the school. No praying in the school. A child was reprimanded for sitting in the hall reading her Bible. That baffles me. Let's bring prayer in when somebody's been shot, and when all of the crying is over, let's take prayer out of it. Let's bring it back in. I had another shooting over there. Let's take it back out. We, gotta have, we, don't, we don't want you to force religion on us. But since 9-11, a lot of those things are going to be taken out as he, he acts like a lamb and speaks like a what? Dragon. Like a dragon. Let's, let's go to, 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 to Tuesday's lesson because the whole gist of this scene is Satan wants worship right here. Uh, the, it is very interesting that uh, we are, uh, as a nation, America is compared as a lamb. A lamb is so simple. You can pet her so easily. It's so gentle. You know, America was involved in World War I, and power was bestowed on America. America was involved in World War II, and more power was bestowed in America. And America became great. The whole world made America great. And now this lamb is talking like a lion. I was roaring like a dragon. What happened? The character of a gentle nation suddenly changed. And then suddenly this is the power that is giving power to the beast. Think about it. Think about all these changes. And we think... Well, it's impossible for a democracy to go this direction. But we're already there. Things that we thought years ago would never, ever happen. You can see how it's going to happen today. But let's just get to the crust of the whole problem. When Satan was in heaven, in heaven what did he want? Worship. He wanted worship. You read there in, uh, is it Ezekiel? Or is it Isaiah? Uh, I will what? Let's, let's read it, folks. Is Ezekiel where? She said Ezekiel 28. Huh? Isaiah? Isaiah 14, starting at verse 13, where it talks about ascending above the clouds. Isaiah? Isaiah what? Isaiah 14, verse 13. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Got a mark in old faithful. Isaiah 14, let's start reading at verse 13. It says, No, let's start at verse 12. It said, What? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, to the ground which did weaken the nation? For thou hast what? Said in thy heart, I will ascend unto the heavens. I will exalt my throne above what? The stars of God. I will sit upon the mouth of the congregation 
on the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. The most high. Satan was simply kicked out of heaven because of what? Self-exaltation, pride. Self pride. A creature wanting to be the what? Wanting to be the creator. Wanting to be God. And, 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 and when I read it, every time you read it, was that there was war in heaven. Satan and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon, and, 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 and there was no room found, and, and he was what? Bible says, I saw Satan like a what? A bolt of lightning coming down to the earth. And in Revelation, the Bible says, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for he's come down having what? Great wrath, he's upset. He wanted worship up there, he didn't get it. Now he's down here, and he's sliding slowly through all of the channels, trying to get worship. And you remember when, when Jesus went into the wilderness, came out of there fasting for 40 days, what did Satan say to him? Anybody remember? All of this I'll give you, just what? If you just bow down and worship me. And Satan is still up to his same old tricks now. He wants, he wants worship. Let's turn over to Wednesday's lesson. Babylon the Great. Let's read some of these texts right here before our time get away. Uh, Going to get some folk who haven't read yet. Jeremiah 51, 6 and 7. Hell, I'm going to get you to read that for me. Get you to read that for me. Um, I'm going to get you to read Jeremiah, Jeremiah 51, and you'll be reading 53 and 57. You'll be reading 6 and 7. All right. Get some folks who haven't read yet. It's so good to have Sister Eric up here today. Uh, he's uh, Zechariah 2.7. The question asks the following text What do they teach us about Babylon? Or oh, he's going to be reading Revelation, not Jeremiah. I'm sorry. Is always advised worship the creator okay no one else is God no one else is creator and when you take the creator away you take away all law because that's the only thing that gives him the right to make the laws the Ten Commandments and all other things that we follow or don't follow when you have all those school shootings um, it breaks down society. If you don't have a creator God, you don't have a real God. And that's why evolution is, is pushed so prevalent. Everything else has no authority at all. Beautiful. Thank you. All right, we're reading that. Jeremiah. Thank you for that point. about five minutes to tie the thing up. Jeremiah 51. Six and seven. Six and seven. Flee from the midst of Babylon and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity 
for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup of the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, the nations are deranged. I like that word, deranged. She's got Jer uh, Jeremiah 15, 53 and 57. Jeremiah what? 51. 53 and 57. Through Babylon were the mound up to heaven, and though she were to fortify the height of her strength, yet from me plunderers would come to her, says the Lord. 56, because the plunderer comes against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men are taken. Every one of their bows is broken, for the Lord is the God of recompense. He will surely repay. 57, please. And I will make drunk her princes and wise men, her governors, her deputies, and her mighty men, and they will shall asleep, a perpetual sleep, and not awake, says the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. All right. Who has the next one? Okay, so, so normal. She's at uh, Zechariah 2.7. Up Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. All right. Revelation 17, 5 and 6. And upon the forehead of and upon the forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered what great, with great admiration. Uh, we got Revelation 18, 1, 2, and 3. Revelation 18, 2, and 3. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, <clears throat> and the merchants of the, of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Let's drop down here with, these, with the pure woman and the harlot. Let's make the comparison here. It says, the pure woman is in heaven. She's clothed with the sun, crowned with seven stars, uh, attacked by the dragon and the, huh? I'm sorry, 12 stars and the mother of what? The remnant. All right, the harlot is what? On the water. Clothed with purple and what? Scarlet. Adorned with what? Gold gems and pearls. Supported by what? Dragon and the mother of harlots. You know, we mentioned that um, Satan is out here wild and crazy trying to get everyone to worship him. But we forget that there are the churches out there that are backing the Catholic Church, that are going after the people and saying, you know, we, we should be all one, you know, and some of these churches are Protestant churches, and I'm, I'm thinking that they're part of that group of the harlot, because we have a lot of these churches that are siding with the Catholic Church, their daughters. 
two things I have to say about that one, and then we're going to read our closing. I get so excited, I'm about to burst. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this is a, a very interesting. We ask the Catholic, what is the biblical day of worship? And the Catholic Church will tell you, it's the Sabbath day. Okay. But why is all the Christianity, all the Protestant, were, and, and so we say, um, so why does the Catholic Church go to church on the Sunday? Mm -hmm. And they say very clearly, this is because the Pope changed the day of worship from the Sabbath to the Sunday. Now, wait a minute. Why do all the other Christian churches follow on Sunday? And they say, ah, this is the sign of our leadership. They follow us. Yes. We establish the Sunday and all the other churches follow us. And that is the evidence. We read this earlier because we're going to have to close here in a minute. I think it was Romans 6.16. 6, That's not it. The text is what we call no man father. We got a hand back there. And then we're going to have to bring it to a close. Got a hand back there. And while you're going to him, uh, the Pope is being called what? Holy Father. And the Bible said calls no man father. Matthew what? Yeah, that's the one we read, read beforehand. Go ahead, sir. You know, I think of all the texts we have read this morning, uh, Revelation 18 verse 4 uh -huh. probably is the most important one to me where we're all called to come out of her and be not partakers of her sins. Um, that's where we ought to be because I think most of us Christians right now, we are waiting for the knee-jerk reaction. We're waiting to see, you know, when this happened, then I will do this. But all this time... The enemy has laid his foundation, has put systems in place, and when we would try to react, it's too late. Many of us are looking, waiting, about waiting for, like, for example, oh, I'm waiting to see when the Sunday law is going to pass, or this is going to happen, then I will do this and I'll do that. But it's too late. There are certain rules that are running parallel to us right now, and they're probably on a two-degree separation. And you don't even realize that you're on a separate path until it's too late, because one road is already deviating from the other. So by the time I go to react with my spiritual life, it might be too late. And we, we read about the ten virgins, and sometimes we say, oh, that's not me, the five foolish virgins. But if we're not making preparations now, when we try to come out, there's no way to come out. It's too late. And that's why Jesus Christ said, when you see these things, you know, the ab abomination, desolation, standing afar off, that's when we need to get out, and now is the time for us to act. So I really love Revelation 18, verse 4, come out. Brother, I'm so glad you said that. That's, that's just a beautiful thought. The text we, we read earlier in, in, in uh, Matthew 23, 9, it said, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. You hear people call him father. You hear uh, uh, preach, people uh, call him preachers reverent. Uh, uh, the Bible says, "Holy and Reverend is His name." So we're, we're, we're taking on name, but I, I do I do want to to read this. I always like to read the the further thought question, kind of tie everything together. Let me get a nice strong voice. Go ahead and read that for me. Um, which one? Right here, that paragraph right there. Kind of tie everything together. Which paragraph? I'm sorry, he needs his spectacle. Just read that as we close it out. <laughs> Satan's attack on God's law is an attack on God himself, both on his authority and on his government. So in the last days, in the climatic events of the final crisis, Satan will be attacking those who keep the commandments of God. For they alone will be refusing to pay him homage through their proxies here on earth. The battle that he waged against God in heaven long ago will be continued here on earth. And just as he was defeated in heaven, he will be defeated here on earth. From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. 
It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth to deceive men and thus lead them to transgress God's law is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. Whether this be accomplished by casting aside the law altogether or by rejecting one of its precepts, the results will be ultimately the same. He that offends in one point manifests contempt for the whole law. His influence and example are on the side of transgression. He becomes guilty of them all. That is powerful. I want to end right here. While we are coming out of Babylon, it is still our job to warn those who are yet there. It is our job to help people see what's happening here. Many of them don't see it, but we see it. And we have all of this wisdom and this knowledge. It is our duty to share every person that God placed in your path of where we are. Tell them about this dream. Let us close. Lord, we thank you so much for Daniel and Revelation. We thank you so much for the dream. And Lord, we thank you that you are still in control. Help us to be about our Father's business. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn 421. Uh, I've been working on that hymn, but I wanted to uh, use it in the future. If you, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, 421, for all the saints. Does anybody know that hymn? I see one hand. Only one hand. Nobody else knows that hymn? It's such a beautiful one, and I wanted in the future to sing it, but I didn't want to throw it at you if, you, if no one knew it. Okay. For all the saints, bum, 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 ba, ba, da, da, bum, da, 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 Nobody else has heard it? Okay, all right. Well, I'm going to table it for the future because I think it's such a beautiful, glorious hymn. But for today, let's use hymn 83. And then after that, let's use 229. I haven't heard her sing that in a long, long while. All hail the power of Jesus' name. So we'll start with 83, and then we'll go to 229. And I hope you will really sing to the glory of God. 
singing is such a wonderful way to praise God. We should give it our best, all we have. Even if you don't know it, pretend like you know it and follow the organ. <laughs> All together. Let's try 229, all hail the power of Jesus' name.
Let's all sing together. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Thank you so much.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. Please kneel with us in prayer. join us in singing our call to worship this is your house Father and our God, once again, we are grateful to be here today, thankful that you have seen us through another week, and we pray that in this service, you may be manifested, you may be here through the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Join us in singing our first worship song, It Is Well With My Soul.
Sunday song. This is the time where we get to go around and greet each other after a long week.
may be seated. Good morning and a warm word of welcome to everyone who has been able to join us this morning and also to those of you joining us from home. Happy Sabbath. So for all of you visiting today, we'd love to offer you a special gift to show that we're really glad that you're here and um, we have a special homemade gift for you and I'm looking for the bread, but I'm also looking for the visitors because I have no visitor cards. And so I just, it would help me if you could raise your hand if you are visiting with us today. Welcome. Where are you coming from today? From Northwest Virginia. We're really glad to have you. Thank, thanks for being here. Anybody else? This whole row, I see a whole row. <laughs> Who's going to represent your row and tell us where you're coming from? From the area or from outside the area? That's okay. I, I won't put you on the spot. And I'm also not seeing that we have our bread. Is anybody? No. Unfortunately, today, it must be summertime and someone's taking a break. So we don't have our bread today. I'm sorry. Um, but we have a lot to look forward to. And our um, pastor is going to give us a few remarks and announcements at this time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's been a long time since we've been here, and I'm uh, <laughs> glad to be back. Um, I, just, uh, I just appreciate the, the young people taking part in the service this morning. Amen. Amen. It takes a lot of courage to get up here. And uh, so thank you again for um, being willing to be used by God. Um, we want to recognize in a special way all of the graduates that are graduating this year. And so... Uh, if you are graduating from any grade, I would like for you to stand at this time. Anybody graduating from any grade this year? All right. All right. Praise God. There are a couple of uh, students that are going to be uh, recognized at the special program this, this evening. Um, here at the church. And um, we'd like to remind you that uh, every Wednesday here in our church, we have a special time. We want to invite you to come out to prayer meeting. And it's just one hour from 7 to 8. And we are studying the miracles of Jesus. And so we want to encourage you to come out for that. We also like to encourage everyone to pray for the individuals that you see up on the screen. Um, I know we show it every every uh, weekend, but um, the list uh, keeps changing and we keep adding names as well. As you can see, the last name that you see there is Pastor Rick Jordan. He spoke here a few, um, a couple of months ago and um, he, uh, he had an operation and uh, the operation was successful. We were able to visit with him yesterday up in Woodbridge and uh, so we are praising God for that. Some of the upcoming events, there is an insert in your bulletin. It looks like this from uh, Personal Ministries, and that is Adopt a Laundromat. And uh, the information is in there. We've been talking about this for uh, a few weeks now. But uh, today is the day. How many of you are excited? All right. <laughs> today is the day when we are going to two places. One is to the laundromat and also to Aldi's. And uh, what we are providing is quarters so that people can get their cart when they go to all these and also uh, they can wash their clothes at the laundromat or dry their clothes and uh, it's just a way of showing the love of Jesus with people and um, we are going to have a little short uh, training session before we go uh, and so all the information is there in, uh, in your bulletin all right what's going to happen tomorrow Soccer, finally, right? Yeah. After a few weeks of post rain and all that, uh, tomorrow um, our coach is uh, wanting to see everyone that is interested to come out. Uh, they're going to be there from 9 to 10.30. Is that correct? All right. Well, that is all I have. I'd like to welcome everyone 
to our church. God bless you all. Michelle was supposed to have a mission report today, but something came up, and we're going to do that at another time. Thank you. Good morning, children. It's that very special time in our service where you get to help collect the offerings for the TLC Prep Scholarship Fund. Thank you so much for doing this. And we love to see your happy faces and your bright smiles as you make your way around the church. And your story today is going to be my Mrs. Jane Treichler. Sorry. Okay, now it's working, right? Okay, the story today is about a little boy that wanted to go see Jesus. So his mommy said, yes, you can go, but let me pack you a lunch first. Do you know what she packed him? Bread? How many loaves of bread did he get? No? Five loaves of bread and two... Fishes, yes, so one, two, and then I have five loaves of bread in here. So the little boy walked a long ways to see Jesus, and there was like over 5,000 people there to see Jesus. And it got to be late in the day, and they, the disciples decided that the people must be hungry. So they went out. Jesus said, well, let's go see if we can buy them some food. And the disciples said, no, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. So they went out in the crowd and they found one person who was willing to share their lunch. Those people had been listening to Jesus all day long, but nobody was willing to share their lunch but that one little boy. So you know what happened? He blessed the food. And the disciples were able to pass out the food to everybody that was there. And they had more than enough to eat. Because that one little boy 
remembered what Jesus was saying, that you need to do good to other people. Now, I want to share a story with you. When I went to Africa on a mission trip a few years ago, we were going and we had a few loaves of bread and some peanut butter, and we were making sandwiches in the bus to give the people when we got there. And when we got there, there was lots of people, a lot more than what we thought. And we were going to do worship with them and have something like vacation Bible school, and then we were going to feed them. But these people were so hungry and so tired because they had walked so far to see us that they wanted, they needed to eat. And before we had gotten off the bus, we didn't know if we had enough food or not, so we prayed over the food that God would bless the food that we had and that we would be able to feed the people. And when we got there, there were so many, we thought we knew for sure we were going to run out of food. But we passed out all the bread, all the sandwiches to the people, and we had some lemonade, and we had lemonade for them and some fruit, and we didn't know if everyone got to eat or not. But as we looked around and we saw all these people out in the field, they were all sitting down and eating the sandwiches that we had brought. So we got to witness this uh, story of where God blessed the food that we had and we were able to, fill, to feed multitudes of food, multitudes of people with our food. And these are some of the pictures of us uh, passing out clothes and getting ready. And some of these kids hadn't eaten for a whole week. And uh, when they got their sandwich, they were so thankful. Okay? And we had some books to pass out and some shoes, but in this picture we had ran out of shoes. And this was at a welcoming center that the group had built. So thank you for listening. So remember that Jesus can bless your efforts when you want to do the right thing for him. Okay? Thank you. Right. Caleb, you want to have prayer? No? Oh, okay. Who wants to do prayer? You okay? Come on, you two. My two little Davids. <laughs> Jesus, thank you for um, the Sabbath to, to the, the, uh, today, and thank you um for the storms and thank you to the sun shining today amen dear jesus have a say good and help god have a great day amen amen thank you guys <laughs> have some good news. The bread has arrived. So we're going to try this again, and I promise not to put anyone on the spot. So if you are a visitor today, if you're visiting with us, please raise your hand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other, any other visitors? I know there's more visitors, but it's okay. Our family got bread for like a year before we, <laughs> when we started coming here. We, did, we never turned it down. Um, well, we have um, many different kinds of prayer requests and needs on our hearts, but at the same time, we share one common need of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So whether you choose to come forward or remain in your pew, let us join together now in kneeling for our garden of prayer.
Heavenly Father, what an awesome privilege it is to be in your presence on this beautiful Sabbath morning. We have gathered here to worship you, our divine creator. We have come to be awakened and renewed by your splendor, to hear your wise counsel, and obey your holy rules. You are timeless and eternal, and you love us with a love that never fails. How blessed we are by your faithfulness, mercy, and compassion. Your name is holy, your word is holy, and we can only praise you. Forgive us for the times we have not treated you with the reverence and honor that you deserve. Thank you for the many ways that you show your love for us and help us to show the same love to others. There are so many people suffering, Lord, we don't understand or really even know about the trouble that people are having in their lives. Give us hearts that can discern people's hurt and pain so that we can share our hope and saving grace through knowing you, the master healer. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Hear the prayer requests of those who have come forward this morning and also the needs of each of the members on our church prayer list. Be with our students who are graduating this year and bless them as they travel new paths. Be with the Vasquez family and Pastor Jose as he shares your message today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you turn in your Bibles with me to Exodus 19, verses 3 to 6. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading of his word.
Cause every fear and the ones who will need you will walk away healed. So I rest in your promises. Now I'm sure of this. I'm yours. No power is strong enough to separate me from your love. I'm yours. So let the waters rise. I will stay as the oceans roar. Let the earth shake beneath me. Let the mountains fall. You are God over the storm, and I am yours. Even the thunder and the wind obey at the command of my Father. Father, I set my feet upon your mighty name. So let the rain fall hard. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Forgot to mention a couple of things, and uh, before we get into the message, <clears throat> um, it's good to see Van with us. Amen. We have been praying for you, and um, you look like a million dollars. <laughs> you know the story. And uh, it's good to see um, Gladys as well. Gladys, where are you? Right in the back. Praise the Lord. It's good to see our uh, returning university students uh, who are with us today, um, Madeline and Jordan in the back. And um, so we, uh, we praise God for you. Um, and I forgot to mention that one of our, um, one of our members is in, uh, in the hospital, and that is Dervant uh, Clark. Uh, he's also in Woodbridge. Uh, we went to see him yesterday. Um, and so let's continue to pray for him and for all the people that, that you saw on the list there. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Our Father, <clears throat> once again, Father, we are grateful to be here. And we pray that as we open your word, that you may speak to our hearts, that the Holy Spirit may come and dwell in us, and uh, may Jesus Christ be seen once again. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> in the journey to the promised land, as we have looked, God guided his people, and God was with them every step of the way. The same is true for us today. Just as God led his people in the past, God is willing to lead us today every step of the way, which means that we are not alone in this journey. Yes, troubles may come, and they will. Dif different circumstances will arise. Um, but God promises to be with us every step of the way. 
And so we have to take courage in the fact that God is there. Amen? Amen. I just happened to see in the back there a familiar face, and that is Jackie. Jackie, we are so glad to, to have you with us. <clears throat> so today, we are going to look at the subject, Saved to Serve. Did you know that we are saved by God, not just for the sake of saving us, but he has a greater purpose for our life. In other words, he saves us so that we can serve him. In other words, if you are not serving, if you're not serving God in some capacity, whatever he has called you to do, then you need to pray. You and I need to pray in a special way for God to reveal to us what is it that he wants us to do, all right? So we are saved to serve. The journey from Egypt to Canaan was a long one. It was God's purpose to introduce his people into the promised land as soon as possible. But as they went, as you know, as you know the story, as you read the book of Exodus and other books there in the Old Testament, there were some things that they needed to learn. And there were some things that they needed to unlearn. And, um, and so as they went on their journey, it was not easy. It was desert. It was unhospitable um, environment for them because in the desert you have no water. But praise God, the God who called them out of Egypt was with them every step of the way. And so as we saw, God provided food for them. It was called manna, and it was called bread from heaven. How long did God feed them? Forty years. Did you know that? Wouldn't you like to be in a place where you don't have to, you don't have to um, work, you might say, for your food? The food is free, right? You ever seen people that, um, that you invite them um, to, uh, to some function? Uh, we're going to go uh, out uh, as missionaries, and there is going to be free food. And a whole bunch of people show up, right? Well, God provided for them food for them to eat. As we looked just a few weeks ago at uh, Exodus 17, as the, peop as the people faced another crisis in their life, they had no water, God opened for them uh, or provided for them water from the rock. And as we saw that particular week, that rock represented Jesus Christ. And so, what a God that we have. When we are hungry, he provides food. Amen? Amen. When we are thirsty, he provides what? Water. And then, if it gets too hot, he provided a what? A cloud by day. And then if it gets too cold, he provided what? A pillar of fire by night. In fact, the Bible says that their shoes did not wear out those 40 years. I would like to have some shoes like that, right? Well, what it means then is this. That if you and I follow God in this journey to the promised land, meaning heaven... God is going to provide for us everything that we need. Do you believe that? Do you believe um, that God is able to do what he has promised to do? Amen? And so this morning, we are going to look at Exodus chapter 19. And I'd like for you to open your Bibles, if you don't mind, to Exodus 19. And uh, we are going to begin at verse 1. Exodus 19, verse 1. You can open your Bibles in your phone. If you have a Bible, uh, there's a Bible right in front of you. You can look at your neighbor's Bible. Just don't take it, amen? All right, so Exodus 19, verse 1. If you have it, say amen. All right, Exodus 19, verse 1. It says, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. 
So how long had it been since they left? Three months, right? Three months. A long time to be in the desert. But God was with them, amen? And the Bible says that they came to the wilderness of Sinai. In verse 2, For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. Now, it is interesting that the Bible says that they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Now, there are two peninsulas. This is, this is, I found this to be interesting. There are two peninsulas, the Sinai Peninsula and also the Arabian Peninsula. Now, just so you know, there are some people that believe that the mountain that is, that is mentioned here is the mountain where Moses first met God in the burning bush. And so some people place the mountain right there in, uh, in Sinai, right there. That's the traditional place that is believed where Moses uh, actually met with God face to face. And so this is the actual mountain. And uh, many people have gone there to, uh, to visit as tourists. And, uh, and they actually go up on top of the mountain. Wouldn't you like to be uh, uh, that person to go on top of the mountain and be able to see and witness uh, where God spoke. Now, there is another place uh, that people believe that this mountain is located, and that is in the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, there are arguments for both. We're not going to get into those right now. But, um, but I believe that it was in the Sinai Peninsula as, uh, as it mentions there. And so this was the place where Moses first saw the burning bush. And as he saw this bush that was being burned but not being consumed, he got curious. And God, as he got close to the bush, God spoke to him. And God gave him his call for his life. And uh, before he got uh, any closer, God told him to do something, and that is, uh, Moses, I want you to take your shoes off, your sandals off, because the place that you're standing on is what? Is holy ground. I submit to you today that just as God called Moses for a mission in his life, God calls us, his children today, to be involved and uh, engaged in the mission that God has for us. See, we are not going to be happy unless we discover what that mission is. And unless we are engaged in what God has called us to do, we are not going to be happy. All right? <clears throat> and so, the Bible says that Israel, in verse 2, the last part of verse 2, camped there before the mountain. So this was the mountain of God. Verse 3. And Moses went up to God, went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Now, the first thing I notice as, as, uh, as Moses comes cl close to the mountain, the Bible says in verse 3, And Moses went up to God. I submit to you, that if you and I want to have an experience with God, we need to go up with God. Now, I'm not saying, as, as some people have said in the past, I'm not saying that you have to take your life. Did you know that? Uh, have you heard of Jim Jones? He told the people, now, it is God's will for us to be with him. So let us speed up the process let us drink this poison so that we are with God right away. I'm not saying that, okay? Um, and there have been others as well. When God says in here in verse 3, and Moses went up uh, to God, it means that we must go up to God continually. How do we do that? How do we go up to God? Well, through prayer. Now, we say that, 
But do we really believe that? Not only do we believe that, do we practice that? Is God a crutch in your life? Is God like Santa Claus in your life? In other words, do you go to him only when you need something from him? See, God wants us to have a one-on-one close relationship with him. And so God wants us to go up to him through prayer. Because you see, when you pray, God doesn't come down to your level. When you pray, you actually go up to his level. You actually come up to him. Amen? So many times we want God to come down to our level. But God wants us to come up to his level. Amen? And what a privilege we have when we pray. You can talk to God at any time. Amen? He has a data plan that is out of this world. Did you know that? It doesn't cost you anything. In fact, there are no dead spots in God's plan. Amen? In fact, if I, if I, if I drive, uh, drive down on three going towards Culpeper, there is a section, a large section, that my phone says no signal. No signal at all. But that's not the case with God. With God, everywhere you go, you can find him. Did you know that? In fact, when you are at your last straw, you might say, you may be in, in the belly of a fish like, like Jonah. And, and you may cry out to God from the belly of the fish in the middle of the ocean. And God hears your prayer. Amen. Amen? I want us to be praying people. Amen? I want us to be uh, a men and women of prayer. I want us to be children of prayer. That whenever... Uh, whatever situation we're in, we can talk to God and he listens to us. Listens to us. Amen. Now this morning, as I was talking to one of our newly um, transfer members, um, this, this, uh, this lady um, is a missionary for God. Did you know that? She goes from place to place. She goes from country to country, and uh, she says, I am going to uh, South America in just a few days, and, and I need prayer. So at this time, I'd like for us to pray in a special way for uh, Raquel. Raquel. Raquel, raise your hand. This is Raquel, one of our newest uh, transfer members, and um, we need to pray in a special way for her. Can we do that right now? Let's bow our heads. Our Father and our God, we pause to thank you for the privilege of prayer. We pause to ask you in a special way to bless Raquel as she goes to South America. And then other places, Lord, may you give her success. May you work through her and through those who are going to those places, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, <clears throat> we must continually go up to God. See, the devil will try to convince us that prayer is a waste of time. Did you know that? Some people say, well, if God knows everything, even before I ask him, then why ask him? I mean, after all, he knows what I'm going to say before I say it, so why say it? See, prayer is not to benefit God. Prayer is to benefit you. Uh, prayer does not change God. Prayer changes you. See, the truth of the matter is, is that we need changing in our life. And, and one of the ways that God is able to shape us and mold us into his image is through prayer. But I dare say sometimes that we don't pray as we should 
because we don't want to change. <laughs> we don't want to change. We want to, we want to remain the same way. We don't want to get too close to God because that means that we, we are going to see ourselves as we really are. So we rather stay hidden in the dark so that we don't see ourselves as we really are. So the truth is that we need changing in our life. And one of the ways that we change uh, is, is through prayer. Amen? So Moses went up to God. And notice what happens there in verse 3. It says, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. So when you and I come up to God through prayer, and we talk to him through prayer, we commune with him through prayer, be ready for God to speak to you. Be ready for God to communicate his message to you. So as soon as he goes up to the mountain, the Bible says, the Lord called through. Uh, call him from the mountain and this is what God said to him thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel see when God speaks to us he has a mission for us to do amen so so we have to be in touch with God through prayer we cannot sidestep uh, or bypass the importance of talking to God at any time in our life. And be ready when you talk to him. He is going to talk to you. Isn't it wonderful. That God is willing to talk to us. In spite of us. In spite of ourselves. In spite of our condition. God is willing to talk to us. And um, he says I want you to say exactly. I want you to speak to the children of Israel. What I'm going to tell you. So verse 4. The Bible says, <clears throat> the Bible says in verse 4, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So here is what I want you to notice. In the experience of the Exodus, in the experience that God um, was with them and took them out of Egypt, he says, don't forget what God has done for you. See, it is a dangerous thing to forget the miracles of God. Sometimes in our sophisticated society, um, we, we tend to rationalize everything that happens in our life. Well, I have this car because I worked hard to get this car. Or I have this house because I worked hard to get this house. And I'm not saying you shouldn't work, okay? I'm not saying you shouldn't prepare yourself and go to school. What I'm saying is this. Don't forget what God has done for you. Amen. See, their deliverance was supposed to be fresh in their minds. They were not to forget. In fact, there is a, a statement and, um, <clears throat> that the servant of the Lord says. It says, we have nothing to fear for the future unless we forget how the Lord has led us in our past experience. There is a danger, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a danger in forgetting the miracles of God. In fact, many years ago, in fact, I, I think I should do that again. Many years ago, I used to have a journal. And, and I entitled that journal, uh, Miracles That God Has Done For Me. And in that journal, I, I chronicle what God had done uh, at different times in my life. And <clears throat> whenever I was discouraged or I faced a crisis in my life, I would go back and I would read what God did for me in the past. And as I read and as I remembered, guess what? I was encouraged. I was encouraged that, hey, God is with me. Amen. God is going to see me through. God is going to help me. So, when we go up to God, we will hear him speak to us. Amen? So, he says, I don't want you to forget that uh, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, he uses an illustration of the eagle. Um, did you know that eagles 
uh, at times they carry their young in their back and, and, uh, and, and transport them to higher places. In fact, the eagle will do anything to save um, the, young, the young eagles, even lose his life for that. He says, I want, you to re- I want you to remember that I bore you on eagle's wings. And I want you to notice the last phrase in, the, in that verse. He says, and brought you to what? To myself. So here's the thing. God saves us to bring us to himself. Did you know that? In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that says that God was um, in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He saves us for a purpose. He saves us to bring us to himself. See, one of the greatest desires that God has for us is that he wants to have a one-on-one relationship with us. So he saves us to bring us to himself. Amen? And so the Bible says in verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is what? For all the earth is mine. Now, listen to what God is saying. I have saved you. I have brought you out of Egypt to bring you to myself so that you can have a relationship with me, one-on-one relationship with me. And, um, and he says, if you will indeed obey my voice. So God calls us to obedience. Amen? When we come to God, obedience will be the fruit of that relationship. In other words, you are going to do things not because you have to do things, but because you love God. Did you know that obedience has to be based on love and love, and, and love alone? Because if obedience is based on anything else, it's not, it's not, um, it's not obedience at all. It is, it is called legalism. Did you know that? In other words, Jesus put it this way. Jesus said, if you love me, then what? Keep my commandments. So the love has to be there in order for us to rightly obey God. So the fruit will be manifested through our obedience. Amen? And so he says, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, what's going to happen? Then you shall be a what? A special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is is mine. See, later on, God says, I want you to build me a, a sanctuary. And he tells them the reason why. He says, I want you to build me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among you. That I may dwell among them. And so, one of the desires of God in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, is for us to have that one-on-one relationship with him. When we love God, we are not going to question why we should obey him. We are going to lovingly obey what he says to us. Amen? Nobody has to tell us that we have to reach out to our neighbors. Nobody has to tell us that uh, we have to be involved and engaged in the mission of the church. When we love God, we are going to uh, lovingly obey him and do his mission. Amen? So, God calls us to obedience. But that's not the only thing. If you look in verse 6, the Bible says, And ye shall be to me a kingdom of what? Of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak which you shall speak to the children of Israel. In other words, not only are we called to obedience, lovingly obey God, which is the fruit of that relationship, but God calls us to be a kingdom of what? Of priests. A a kingdom of priests 
in a holy nation. What does a priest do? What is the function of a priest? A priest is one who intercedes. A priest is one who prays. A priest is one who looks after the welfare of the other person. A priest is one who is interposed between heaven and earth. Praise God that Jesus Christ is our priest. Amen? Amen. He is our, our high priest, as the Bible says, that has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Amen? He knows what it is to feel pain. He knows what it is to, to feel lonely. And he knows what it is to feel rejected. But God is willing to help us in our struggle. Amen? And so, a priest essentially is one who serves. In other words, God saved his people to bring them to himself so that they could obey him, but that obedience is manifested in service. Did you know that? So he, he saves us in order for us to serve. If you and I are not engaged in some kind of ministry, then we are doing God a disservice. Did you know that? We have not really understood what our mission is. If you and I come to church Sabbath after Sabbath just to warm the pew, then, then something is wrong, right? If you and I are not engaged in some kind of ministry in, in our day-to-day -day life, then, then we're not living up to the calling that God has for us. You see, God called his people, he says, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. In other words, there are people that you know, some of your co-workers, maybe some of your neighbors, maybe some in your family. There are people that need to be connected with God, with God amen? There are people that need to be prayed for. There are people that need to be uh, stirred by the Spirit of God. And you are that link. You are there for a special purpose. So, this is why God got his people out of, out of Egypt. So that they could serve him. Be involved in some kind of service. Now, did you know that Jesus calls us individually? Jesus called his disciples individually to do his work. Number one, to follow him. And then... He not only calls us individually, but he calls us collectively as a church. Ministry does not necessarily happen within the walls of the church. Ministry has to happen outside the walls of the church. When that co-worker of yours is going through a difficult time in their family, when, um, when they are facing a crisis in, in their life, a medical crisis, pray for that individual. And don't just say, I'm going to pray for you. Because, you know, sometimes life happens and, you know, we forget. But actually, take the time to say, is it okay if I pray for you right now? That will mean a lot to that person. Did you know that? And so... Wherever we are, in whatever capacity God has called us, there is a mission. God says, go ye into all the what? All the world. Right? So our mission is to go. To share Jesus with, with others. Yes, God has called us as individuals and he has called us as a church. Now, I want to be obedient to the call of God. I don't want to be in disobedience. And so, <clears throat> my wife and I 
have been talking. We do talk. Amen? <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I'm, I'm, I might get in trouble. <laughs> so, so we've been talking, my wife and I, and, and, and we came to the conclusion, God has brought us here for a purpose. We don't want to be, we don't want to be the cause of frustrating the call of God for us here. So our commitment to you and our promise to you is that we are going to be engaged and involved as much as we can in everything that we do here in the church. But we can't do it alone. What we need, number one, is your prayers. Number two, be part of the solution. You know, it is easy to say, hey, Pastor, why isn't the church doing this? And why isn't the church doing that? My question to you is this. What are we doing about it? Because it's easy to talk. But I tell you what, it is hard to be involved in the mission of the church. Right? And so, number one, pray. What does God want me to do? How do I become a support to the mission of the church so that more people can come to know Jesus Christ? Because that's the ultimate, the ultimate goal. Amen? Am I allowing God to utilize my gifts, whatever gifts those are, in, in, in the mission of the church? Or am I hiding my gift? Well, Lord, I only have one gift. I only know how to sing. If you know how to sing, praise God. Amen? All I can do, Father, is, is uh, I can only smile. Well, use that smile for God. Amen? Amen? Well, I only have a trumpet. What am I supposed to do with that trumpet? Blow the trumpet. Amen? 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 So, if you're young and you have a lot of energy, channel those energies for the cause of God. Amen? If you're seasoned, notice I didn't say old, but if you're seasoned, use your experience to encourage the younger people in our congregation to be involved and engaged in mission. Something for the church. Amen? And so, God called his people out of Egypt. Yeah, he brought them out with a mighty hand. He showed them step by step that he was with them. But he brought them out, he says, to bring you to myself. We need to get to know God personally, amen? He will speak to us. And then he will communicate with us what we need to do. Lovingly obey God. And engaged in the mission of the church in service. Amen? Amen? Don't say, I'm too old. Or, I'm too young. Or, I don't speak the language. Or, I never done that before. Maybe it's time to do it. Amen? Amen? So, um, the call of God is a call to service. And if we're engaged in service, then we are engaged in the mission of God. So I want to pray as we close this morning. Father in heaven, 
here we are, Lord. On this Sabbath morning, at the beginning of summer, many plans are ahead. Some of us are <clears throat> going to be going on vacation. Can't wait to go to this place. Some of us are going to see family. Some of us are going to take a much needed break. But Father, we pray that in all of our activities and everything that we do, in all the planning that we have for the summer, that our foremost interest be to serve you. Thank you, Father, for taking us out of spiritual Egypt, giving us food to eat, spiritual bread, and water to drink, the spiritual drink. Lord, you call us to you. You call us to obedience. You call us to serve you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Our offering today goes to the world budget to support the multilingual and chaplaincy ministries. So let us celebrate God's blessings today and give generously from our hearts with joy and gratitude, as was stated so beautifully in Ephesians 3.18, to God, who is able to do immeasurably far beyond what we can ask or think, and who wants to do even more for us by his power in our lives, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. Will the deacons please stand? Lord, bless these gifts and use them to your service. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
stand for our closing song, I Love to Tell the Story. Father, today we are grateful because your word is, is full of the truth, the truth about you, the truth about our condition, and um, we thank you, Lord, that you, um, you called us to yourself. You want us to come up to you. You want to speak to us, and Father, we pray that we may, may indeed hear your voice because you call us to lovingly obey you and you call us to service, Lord. Bless everyone who's here, those who are watching via the internet. Help us all to realize the mission that you have for us, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 